Hi everybody, good morning. And it's a really pleasure to me to be here at, at the third days of uh, Fast4G. Uh, I'm proud to be the moderator of this presentation, of this session, sorry, that is supported by the European Commission. And the main topic so will be related to Europe and uh, like Inspire and uh, other and more stuff like that. So the first speaker is Hannes Reuter. He's a geocologist at the GISCO and uh, he helps his colleague with uh, geoinformatic stuff. So, hi Hannes, you are alive. I will uh, add also your presentation. And uh, so the stage is for you. You have 20 minutes plus the question. Okay. Thank you, Luca. Uh, good morning, good uh, afternoon, good evening, everyone around the world. Uh, it's really a pleasure to present to you uh, about uh, work we're doing in the European Commission. Uh, in Bucharest, I had a, a discussion with Topi, maybe a background on that one, and he asked it, and we were talking about what we're doing in the Commission. He says, Hannes, you and what your colleagues are doing, you need to come to Phosphor-G and present what you're doing there, because we, I think, and uh, there were several other people uh, mentioning it, it's important that you describe what you're doing there and the experience you're doing there. And that's the reason why I'm here on stage. Welcome everybody and we'll want to talk a little bit about the usage of Phosphor-G for the provision of corporate level geographic information service of the Commission. And uh, my name is Hannes Reuter and I'm speaking here on behalf of the full uh, GISCO team and uh, I'm located in the European Commission in Eurostat in a small unit called uh, uh, E4 Regional Statistics and Geoinformation. Um, Next slide, please. Um, GISCO stands for Geographic Information Systems of the Commission. You know, the Commission is known for its acronyms. Uh, sometimes people are miss also reading our title for Geographic Information System Coordination, which is part of our role because we are talking and trying to coordinate GIS inside the Commission. For that one, we do the full workflow starting from analyzing, uh, localizing, analyzing, and visualizing geographic information systems we get data from the member states, from commercial sources, from OpenStreetMap. We analyze it making um, travel time distance matrices uh, or even uh, uh, polygons. And we, in the end, we visualize it and providing tools to our colleagues uh, uh, to visualize it, like what you see here on the right side uh, and screenshot from our image tool. So just to give you a little bit of a background, where are we uh, placed? Um, if you ever want to visit us, uh, you have to come to Luxembourg, to the city of Luxembourg, to the nice country which you see here at the top right. Uh, and we are placed uh, in this uh, lovely building here on the lower right corner on top of a shopping center uh, and uh, where we are working. Um, if we're talking about GISCO, um, maybe it's from a, how should I phrase it, from an um, cooperation point of view, we are service provider to the European Commission as well as the European institutions. In that one, we're doing map making analysis. We support statistical production and even provide services. And this is where I would like to talk a lot about what are we using for tools and services, uh, what kind of tools we are using in, inside the Commission. Uh, most of the people, at least in the European sphere, you know, they know us for here what you see on the uh, right side, the NUTS. So these are the statistical regions uh, because we provide them to um, uh, our colleagues here in, in the, on the European continent. And besides that one, we have other roles like uh, we coordination and uh, give mapping advice. But I mean, this goes to far for the discussion which we want to have here today. And I just want to give you um, uh, an, an introduction to that one. Um, if you're working in an institution, usually you're part of a legal act. Uh, Luca already mentioned the Inspire Act, but here for the free and open source software, we have a communication of the commission. Um, at the bottom, you see the, the link for that one. Uh, it's an open source strategy from 2020-23 with a title Think Open, which is a kind of several objectives, which I don't want to spell out here for today, but I think which are really important because we are a heavy user of open source, 
not only in the GIS world, where I will show you today, but also in our uh, software offering from our colleagues in Digit, which is our IT provider in the Commission, uh, where we run uh, uh, something like over 10,000 Apache installations and so on. Uh, so this is one of the things which I want to uh, tell you. So we have a strategy in pay, uh, place here um, where we uh, want to move to. And so, for example, our colleagues in uh, Digit, they're also org organizing workshops and hackathons to improve the situation. Um, to explain to you a little bit so you understand the rest of the presentation, I need to go into a little bit to describe our setup. Um, mm -hmm how we are working, uh, if we're just speaking about cobalt level services. Gisco in its own, you see it here on the lower left, um, we are providing data and services. You might wonder what kind of data is that? This is as simple as the officially approved country data set, which is sometimes quite difficult because people are downloading data sets from the internet and then suddenly afterwards they're getting hit by a shitstorm because they're missing the, uh, the differentiation between Sudan and South Sudan, which already happened a couple of years ago. All these kind of things. So we are providing services to everyone in the European institutions, uh, not only us, it's also uh, other DGs like uh, the colleagues in GSC, which will present afterwards. And we provide also guidance on how to make maps, and we have a dedicated wiki here inside. We provide that not to our, uh, all our colleagues in the European uh, Commission, but also to agencies, European institutions, you, can, you name it, the Parliament, uh, the Council, and so forth, the European Central Bank. And we provide them uh, data and services. And on top of that one, our colleagues in the communication department, they have developed a tool set that is called Web Tools, based on Leaflet, um, which allows to make a, a rather simple maps, uh, which is usually catering for 80% of the use cases in the Commission. And this, uh, what the colleagues here from DGCOM have developed, uh, can be used uh, across the European institutions. And sorry, before you're asking, because uh, we know this kind of question pops up regularly, it's only for European institutions usage, um, but uh, you can have a look at that, that one and you see. So just to give you an example, what kind of COVID level services uh, we are doing. Um, usually, sometimes we're explaining just go today, we are here in a GIS environment, so everybody knows about it. But for the layman, usually you can t tell them and they don't grasp it. And you, if you tell them where the Google Maps or the map of, of the European institutions, then usually it snaps and they say, ah, yes, I know Google Maps. And this is where we are coming into place. So uh, we are in around uh, 15,000 websites. So here you, sh you show, uh, you see an example. For example, if you go to dataeuropa.eu, uh, it's a project by our colleagues from DigiConnect, or where they try to combine, harvest, compile all open data sets in Europe, um, including uh, also the non uh, open data sets, but you can go, go, go in there and you even have a geospatial uh, application which then uses the background maps from us. Um, you can do the same for uh, if, if you're an Erasmus student. So Erasmus is a student exchange program in the European world where you can go from uh, Paris to study in Berlin or wherever you want to go to. And you need to calculate the distance between uh, your start and end points, the university where you go to and uh, where you're living to, because that uh, calculates, or this is an incentive for applying for some money for your travel. So there's a distance calculator at our uh, Erasmus uh, webpage, and we sub support it. If you apply for a visa, you see the, the country outlines here coming, uh, as well in our official um, uh, telephone book of the Commission, you see here uh, JSON interpretation of our buildings of the Commission on top of uh, a background map. Um, as well, our colleagues from DG, uh, uh, sorry, from the External Action Service, uh, which are presenting uh, um, tools or services, uh, what they're doing in the world, just to give you an impression where we are used. So now we already come to what kind of services we're using and what kind of uh, free and open source software we're using for that one. Um, everything builds on top of our uh, central corporate database, where we try to maintain and version our different data sets. And from there, we spill out then the different services, 
being at a map service, reverse geocoding, routing, ID service, image dissemination, and internal metadata portal. I will come through that one. So image, for example, you see the link down here is our map making tool intended for um, our policies officer built on D3. And in the end of the presentation, uh, uh, Eurostat MapGS is underlying a D3 library developed by my colleague Julian Gafuri. And uh, you can use it there uh, if you have an EU login. Um, then we disseminate P uh, data, so simple like here, uh, healthcare services obtained from national uh, authority combined by uh, Eurostat and Gisco and then disseminated out to everyone. Or we have, for example, our internal metadata portal based on open source geo network, which we're using to uh, uh, collect and maintain the metadata for uh, commission internal use. Um, I want to go now into the different uh, other services like our background maps. Uh, here we use from a free and open source perspective uh, Map Proxy, MapNIC, Postgres um, to provide a variety of background maps. Um, based on OpenStreetMap, we customize it. I will come to that one in a second. Based on your geographic data, this is the Association of National Mapping Agencies uh, in Europe, National Mapping and Cadastral Agencies, sorry, to be precise, Natural Earth, uh, NASA. Um, we provide it in multilingual, so we uh, render it in all the EU languages and the, the extent uh, depending on the projection and on the data set, uh, and also the zoom level depends uh, how far you can go. So. Um, just to give you two different Im impressions of styles which we have employed here and uh, uh, show. Um, just to give you a, an example of uh, if I'm talking in, about political correctness, um, here I show you two different examples of Kosovo and Crimea because we as a European Commission have a dedicated opinion on that one. And for that one, you find usually on, on all our websites somewhere a disclaimer because we cannot ensure that the 300 plus issues in the world are always uh, sorted out by us. We have the disclaimer. And if we are no, uh, getting aware of something, um, we try to fix it. This is something like ma mapping guidelines is an interesting example of our work working in an in our in environment like ours. For example, like about the Czech Republic. The Czech Republic, three years ago or four years ago, the people uh, were calling me and or uh, calling us and asking, Hannes, why don't you check, uh, change the label from Czech Republic to Czechia? Google has done it. Okay, you do your background check, you go and check Czechia. Yeah? Hmm. Google Maps has changed it. Hmm. Because Google Maps is known that depending on the IP address where you are, you, you get a different representation. Hmm. They have changed it. Hmm. ISO standards also have changed it. But what's the reference? And then you go after the reference and you see a press release from the Czech uh, tourist office. And you, then you think, mm, okay, let's check back with our political uh, stuff. So we went up all the, uh, the way up to our council. And then it comes back to us and says, uh, please do not change it. The official name uh, assigned to you is still the Czech Republic. And it took another two years until that letter was received, uh, arrived from the Czech government in the commission and the uh, commission voted on that one and then we could implement it. These are our um, uh, particularities working in a um, corporate environment like ours. Just to give you a little example. We also do, uh, we have different ways to do reverse geocoding and geocoding. Um, we have it on different yeah, extents and also different timely updates. Uh, we have our own Nominaten instance, our own Photon instance. Uh, behind a Postgres uh, database, and we provide different services. So, for example, the Photon is used for search as you type functionality. Uh, we even have a batch geocoding interface, and you will see the Ados API in a second, where we're working on uh, authoritative data from the member states, which we try to uh, get uh, via the Inspire process. Um, just to show you here an example from the Ados API, which we are working on uh, uh, for the moment to improve it. Uh, because people are coming to us, um, so I just one step back. It's built on Postgres and a Node.js front end. Um, why have we implemented this tool for our colleagues? Because um, people enter addresses in free form text without any validation. And if you want to geocode it, 
uh, reality has shown that uh, if you reach 80%, 70%, 90%, depending on which country you are, you're already good. And the rest you need to still fix manually. And that's a really issue. And we want to provide a tool for our colleagues, which can automatically validate and sanitize uh, their data sets. And you have seen, maybe you have seen it, that it's a JSON response in the, in the back end. And even we have open location code in that. Just to give you an example, um, we have the same also for batch geocoding because our colleagues were asking, hey, we, we have 5,000 addresses and we need to geocode it. For sure, you can go to a commercial service, but certain da data sets cannot leave the commission due to privacy reasons. And then this needs to be all in-house so you can uh, uh, do the geocoding or the reverse geocoding with a simple thing. And we just built it a front end on top of Nominatum here. Just uh, a couple of last ones, ID service. Um, what we learned the hard way is coming from the GIS world that for us, it's just a simple identify um, that didn't fly with our colleagues in the commission. They wanted a simple URL code where they could submit some coordinates and would get uh, and codes for that one, like a NUTS or the country code. Really simple, built on uh, um, with Swagger Open a API specification on top of a Postgres data set. Um, yeah, really nice, uh, but it is one of the um, used uh, services. And sometimes we're getting 9 million requests over a couple of hours. So, I mean, it's uh, really like. Last but not least, uh, routing. Um, we're using OSRM in our uh, instance here um, for the European extent. Uh, we only do car and rail for the moment, uh, and uh, we update it only every uh, six months. Uh, we have also commercial data sources, uh, which we use in the back end for our analytical task. But for what we have on public facing websites, uh, we're using the OSRM instance uh, with OpenStreetMap. So now you might ask, uh, how do we contribute back to the open source community? Um, we usually contribute back if we identify issues, and then we ask our contractors to make pull requests towards um, the source code people, and then we're trying to fix it. Sometimes we're getting it accepted. Sometimes people say, no, we don't accept it. That's all fine with us. We can do, we can try to do the, the best from our side and be open and uh, um, contributing to that one if it's getting accepted or not. Uh, that's uh, up to the maintainers, and that is fine with us. Um, how do we contribute back? What we also do is um, what is that we perform vulnerability assessments, um, which is usually not done or the capabilities in, um, in the open source development world are not there. But from our point of perspective, if we move it to production, uh, it needs to be there, so it's not attackable. Uh, we have done, for example, uh, worked with the GeoCut people on open source geo network. Um, and on PG feature surf and tile surf have communicated and done something like that as well for map proxy, uh, where we just have recently finished it and we will have some further discussions. Besides that one, we also do our own software development. Uh, we, um, so we contribute back to the open source community and can go. So for example, we have developed a tool to uh, aggregate polygons, so the region simplify tool, um, which allows to generalize, uh, um, for example, polygons or country data sets or NUTS data sets to various level. Uh, based on D3, we have the Eurostat map.js, which we uh, I mentioned earlier for the image map making, and uh, GeoDiff, which is allows to mix the difference between two different data sets and, and image, just to give you an example. Um, Having spoken mostly for, for the time now on um, the software stack for our, uh, what we're using for free and open source software uh, for servers, because we also use ArcGIS in the, in the server back, uh, back end. Um, in the service stack for desktop, what we have available to um, all our commission colleagues, we have uh, based on the OSGO installer, we have the whole suite of QGIS, Grass, Saga, GDAL, and um, um, we have over 400 people having installed. Besides, um, we also have ArcGIS and ArcGIS Pro, um, which is reasonable for um, a big organization like us. And we are in a mixed environment in, in that one. So just wrapping up, um, 
what are the lessons learned in general? Um, if you're working in a big organization and not in a science organization or in a private company, you need to have people with creative knowledge, with geo and IT knowledge needed for a change. And the people need to want that change. So you need to have motivated people. And especially if you're in a large organization like ours, um, expect a long time to change at the corporate level. A long time, I can tell you from experience. And my main message to everyone out there in a similar situation like ours, don't get frustrated. Don't get frustrated. I just want to stress it. It will happen at one stage. It will happen. Um, various tools for different things I wrote here, or we wrote here. It's good, and yeah, if, if you, if, 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 as you have seen uh, in the previous slide, what we're doing on desktop and what I mentioned before also on the service level. Yes, it's good to be in a mixed environment because sometimes it doesn't work and then you can still fall back or go to the other side. So it's good to be in a, a, a mixed environment. The point which needs to be stressed, there's training needed. I would say the younger generation is uh, up to the standards, they have learned more and more than st stuff. They have learned free and open source software. So they are easily adapting to that one. And we need to take the whole, uh, everybody on board and uh, using training. Um, what we learned also, you need to be careful. Uh, certain consultants want to use um, or sell their proprietary software, being it Power BI, Click, Tableau, S3, you name it, that's all fine. You just need to be aware. And uh, from a commercial point of view, not from a commercial point of view, from a long distance perspective, what happens in 10 years? Will your uh, system survive in 10 years and still be running? Uh, you never know what happens. Maybe you are going somewhere else, but your system still stays there. You need to take that one to into account. Um, a hard lesson which we learned um, take into consideration what happens if you come from five users. I mean, what works on your desktop is one thing, but if you scale it up, if you have five, 5,000 users, uh, you need to, do, to take it into that one into consideration how to make it fast. And with that respect, uh, uh, you need to always perform an appropriate load test, which sometimes we're missing. And with that one, um, I'm wrapping up. What did you learn today? from today's presentation, hopefully. Uh, I have explained to you a little bit where we are sitting, uh, what we're doing, uh, that we have the European Commission and, and its whole has an open source strategy, second edition now, that we use various tools and services to provide uh, public and internal clients with our um, services, um, that we use a mixed software stack, and we moved from a completely um, proprietary software stack now to a much more open environment and that we contribute back to the community in various ways. And with that one, uh, I want to finish my presentation for today. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, you can contact not only me, but our whole team at estat-gisco at ec.europa.eu. Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot, Anis. Really beautiful and impressive uh, presentation for uh, what the your team is doing um there are a couple of questions from the audience and uh, oh they increase so the first one that i want to show you is on disputed areas do you have a synchronization between european commission country boundaries and the unfao global administrative unit layer Thank you for this question. Um, yes, I mean, the point is we are missing increasingly an update for GAL because it's already outdated and it's not maintained anymore. Um, the Commission has made uh, the following decision. Um, first, the Commission rules. Uh, so if the Commission makes an opinion about how the world has to look or which countries we recognize, uh, this applies. Otherwise, we fall back to the United Nations. And we do not fall back to the UNFAO, global, so the GAL layer, but really to uh, United he Headquarters uh, maps there, to the world maps there. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So the next question is, do you have any 
initiative to propose your DGA approach to other local authorities, especially in Germany, things are so scattered and different portal standards and so on, but it's the same in Italy and I think in all the countries. Mm, yes. Uh, how should I phrase it? Um, I, I would need to make another presentation on that one. Uh, part of our work is we are trying to create uh, pan-European data sets, uh, for example, on the others API based on national data sources. And we see that data quality is a huge issue in the national um, data portals or the data providers even. So I think it's a less technical question here. It's a political. question. It's it's not a it's a political question because, for example, in Germany we have the federal infrastructure, and to break that or to to not to break to bring it together in and to an um, how to say in a constructive standardized way, where everybody has his share his visibility as well, and not asking for uh, charging, then this would be really grateful. So, but, I mean, my, my latest example is from the Open Maps uh, for Europe, just recently released by our colleagues from Eurogeographics. There's a big, big hole for, in, in, for the Eurodam, which is a digital elevation model. There's a big, big hole for Germany, because I, I don't know why the Germans do not provide their digital elevation model, why almost the rest of Europe does it provide it for free. But I mean, this is a little thing, probably someone didn't give it for didn't want to give it out and so then the general stamp is on it and I think this is a general question on political will and let's hope with uh, maybe with high value data sets or other open data act from DG connect we can progress here okay thanks a lot are you moving to IOT and digital twins are you doing uh, this transition? You mean, sorry, I, I would need to have a clarif clarification on that one. That's difficult for me to answer from, from GISCO perspective. I mean, I know I'm aware of uh, that colleagues, other colleagues in the commission working on that one. From GISCO uh, perspective, uh, for the moment, I must say, we are rather resource limited and we have not uh, worked in this direction. Okay. I mean, if okay. you're talking about pan-European data sets from the ground up, like what we have in... Uh, uh, the address API, and if you consider that one, we're doing uh, looking into buildings and cadastral passes is the same here. If you consider that a dig digital twin, that's also one way. But I mean, yes, I would leave it up to uh, other colleagues to answer here and step in, maybe in, f in future presentations. Thanks a lot. And uh, how was the impact of Inspire in your aims and purpose? <laughs> I expected that question. Thank you, colleagues. Um, Inspire gives us a legal act to request uh, certain things. However, and also in the um, revision of the Inspire, which is currently ongoing, from our experience, we see that various member states have not implemented Inspire yet fully, which really hampers, for example, creation of pan-European data sets, which is our uh, uh, work ma mainly. And this is something like, uh, it fa facilitates greatly. I'm greatly, uh, I'm really um, thankful for the Inspire Legal Act, but I think certain member states need still need to step up. Certain member states are excellent in that one, and certain member states are falling behind with their implementation of Inspire. Okay, so the Okay, so the one minute, the time for the last question. Okay. Uh, what stack do you use for system testing to make more uh, sure all the web apps and uh, are you working? Okay. Um, we're writing, okay, um, for the web apps. Okay, uh, I mean, let's let's put it that way. For, for our load tests, I mean, we have integration test, uh, um, 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 system testing. The load, and we could use uh, kind of things. We really, for our API, 
for really our low test, we use a really low level system approach. We just use Siege, S-E-A-G-E, which is a really a C command. You just have a text file with lots of URLs and then you simulate it. And for us, I must say, uh, you could uh, use certainly other uh, tools for that one. Um, this has been proven quite successfully to really low test uh, being at the routing engine. Uh, and uh, with that one, we know exactly can we sustain 500 or 1000 or 20 concurrent users with that siege tool and it stresses and it really tells us something. Okay, so, okay, so thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. And uh, we will. Uh, Thank you. Bye. The next um, speaker is uh, Marco Munghini. He's a sh scientific project officer at the uh, European Commission at GRC. He's a well known uh, person in the OGEO community, he's a chartered member. And uh, oh, Marco? He disappeared right now. <laughs>